Tuesday, when four commuters find a million bucks, they have to steer clear of the good cops, the bad cops, and the mob. Harvey Corman and Ernest Borgnine in Carpool. Then on West 57th. The idea of suicide came in there because it's an experience I went through. West 57th, right after Carpool, Tuesday. This is CBS. Once Upon a Time is the opening line of fairy tales. And it's also a memoir of a woman who has lived a fairy tale life, including the childhood terrors that go with fairy tales. It's a memoir of a time when society was society and the Vanderbilts were the cream of it. Today, the most famous Vanderbilt is Gloria. And as Diane Sawyer reported last April, she's carrying on the family name in a very different way. They're the jeans that fit when you stand and sit. They don't stop because Gloria Vanderbilt bottoms all the time. They're designed for American figures, so they shape your waist, hug your hips, don't gap here. It's not just jeans and perfume. Gloria Vanderbilt has attached her celebrated name to textile, sheets, towels, tableware, greeting cards, and, are you ready for this, Gloria Vanderbilt tofu dessert. But 51 years ago, at the height of the Great Depression, Gloria Vanderbilt was already a household name. She was the prize in the custody battle of the century, a courtroom fight between her aunt and her mother. It was a national soap opera, and Depression audiences didn't want to miss a single episode. The newspapers even coined a phrase for the little girl who rode to the courthouse in a Rolls Royce. They called her the poor little rich girl. And here's the first movie of little Gloria herself. Frightened by the curious crowd, she flees into her aunt's car. Money isn't everything. Gloria's great-great-grandfather, Cornelius Vanderbilt, made the money in shipping and railroads. Back in the 1930s, the Vanderbilts were not only rich as kings, they lived like them. Their houses were palaces, and for that matter, so were their cottages, like the summer house at Newport, called the Breakers. And so, when the lurid courtroom battle began, it was the dynasty or Dallas of its day. Everybody knew the players and had chosen sides. There was Gloria's rich and powerful aunt, her father's sister, Gertrude Vanderbilt, who said Gloria's mother was unfit to raise a child. And Gloria's grandmother Morgan, perhaps the villain of this piece, who also called Gloria's mother, her own daughter, unfit. And on the other side, there was Gloria's beautiful young mother, who had no money of her own, but did have a penchant for the wildlife in Europe. I think some people really shouldn't have children. She was very young when I was born. She was 19. She was very beautiful. And when my father died, she went to live in Europe. And, and imagine her, you know, in Paris at age 20, you know, this incredible beauty and the whole world before. And she wanted to have a good time. That old, so swanky Bulldogs ball. The dazzling pageant of color is studded with celebrities. The famous Mrs. Gloria Vanderbilt arrives in her chariot as the sun goddess, and they dance till dawn, just as in the good old days when depression was only a word in the dictionary. Did she ever spend any time with you? She really didn't, no. I mean, I only saw her when she was all, you know, dressed up beautifully going out. Uh, and I really just didn't see her at all. Gloria had to go to court and tell the judge what she thought about her own mother. What she thought shocked him. She said she hated her mother and confirmed that she had written letters with childish misspellings saying just how she felt. What she didn't tell him is who made her write those letters and write them just that way. My nurse uh, dictated a letter that I should write to my grandmother. Um, saying that my mother um, was a rare beast is what she told me to write. And uh, she even um, misspelled it so that it would look like a child had written it. You were given the exact yes. spelling yes. to use? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. no one ever knew that at the time of the trial. No, I know. She says her nurse, Emma Chryslick, was the person who really loved her and the most important person in her life. She says in this instance, the nurse was only following orders. 
the orders of that fanatical grandmother, Grandmother Morgan, who sided against her own daughter so that Gloria could live like the Vanderbilt she was, and not incidentally, so that the grandmother could live that way too. So your mother's mother, you think, was yes. really the oh yes at the without center of question. the web. Without question, without question. Why? She loved power. I think she thought that the that my aunt Gertrude was very powerful and. She was very ambitious for me. She wanted that for me. I think she was a little crazed, yes, I do. But it was more than just writing letters. You said you hated your mother, you told oh, me. Oh, yes. That. Well, I was coached by uh, my Aunt Gertrude's lawyers to say that for a long time, uh, for hours and hours before the trial. We would go through the whole, um, the whole um, sequence of what I might be asked and what I should say. What was going on inside from the little girl with the frozen smile mm -hmm. and the opaque eyes. Well, you know how rabbits get paralyzed with fear and can't move? I think that's probably the feeling. It was sort of like that. I think at one point you had a series of eight doctors in six weeks with something like 50 examinations. Yes, well, my grandmother uh, told me to pretend that I was sick. Supposedly, I would have to have a, a permanent, stable environment and that my aunt's conditions were much more conducive to that and so forth. So that was all, that was what that was part of. It was all part of the plan. Oh, yes. Did you actually rehearse these aches um, and pain? Yes, she would sort of show me how to do it. If the hatred of her mother was manufactured, the fear was not. Not after the scandalous tales that were told at the trial. A stream of maids and butlers took the stand to tell stories about her mother and her mother's twin sister, Thelma. Stories about lovers of all kinds. Such things may be shocking today, but at least we're used to them. They were 50 times as shocking 50 years ago. I knew that there was some terrible thing that, that, that had been brought out in the trial that, that was... Um, it was the thing which is when they closed the courtroom, but I was not told what it was, and I didn't know what it was, which of course made it really worse. I was at a boarding school in Connecticut, and these two boys were expelled for uh, homosexuality. And of course, it spread through the girls' school like wildfire. I didn't know why they had been expelled or what it meant. And uh, one of the girls um, said to me, that's what your mother is. And I was absolutely, I mean, just, I mean, I was really terrified, you know. Do you yeah. wonder? Did it ever matter? Well, I sort of knew when I went to, to live with her what was going on um, in one way or another. And um, um, that was difficult for, for me, you know. Gloria's mother denied the charges, but the damage was done, and in the end, the judge ruled that Gloria should be taken from her, and that Gloria should live with her aloof, imposing aunt. He also said that her nurse, the one person in the world she needed, had too much influence on her, and sent her away. So you lost the very thing you've been trying that's, to say. That's right, yeah, yeah. What do you think of people who'd put a child through a trial like that? Not much. Newsreel cameras pursued her to the races. Gloria Vanderbilt, once storm center of a sensational court battle, is going on 13 now and quite a sports enthusiast. The day's racing gets away to a flying start. And then through her unsuccessful marriages. At the age of 19, she defiantly married a Hollywood agent, then two other unsuccessful marriages to conductor Leopold Stokowski, 40 years her senior, and director Sidney Lumet. Finally, she says, she married the right man, author Wyatt Cooper, who died seven years ago. But in a curious way, the real legacy of that painful and public childhood may be Gloria Vanderbilt, the businesswoman at work today. She says the only money she values is the money she made herself. They are for girls who have chauffeured cottage. Let's get together with the Vanderbilt. <laughs> Mama may have and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. You know what I mean? In the 1950s, she tried her hand at acting. She became a painter, a textile designer, and after her first clothing company flopped, she pulled herself together and rebounded with those Gloria Vanderbilt jeans. And then, last year, someone sent her a picture of herself she had never seen before. 
The eyes, she said, drew her in, and the memories flooded back. That's when she knew she would write about her childhood. The book is written in part for her children. She has four sons, her youngest here, Anderson Cooper. It's the story of a little girl who proved during the Depression that even money can't buy happiness, and of a woman who went on to prove that even a Vanderbilt can be happy, if she's a Vanderbilt who makes it on her own. What would the Commodore have to say <laughs> about Gloria Vanderbilt on jeans and a tofu dessert and fabrics and writing a book? What would you think about his name on well, some young girl's bottom, I guess? Well, um, I think he would be, in fact, I would love him to be here. I think he would be so dazzled and so impressed at my success in the world of business. Because in the family, all the girls were really very uh, lowly thought of. And he really just wanted to get them married off. And, and the boys in the family, those were the ones that were really only the ones that had clout. And I think he'd be absolutely bowled over. 